This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less tax. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So the day's going to come when we're going to want to retire. We're going to want to not be working all the time. And the question is, how do we get there? Do we get there through that standard retirement plan, 401k, pension plan, or we do, or do we do something else? So today I have a very special guest, my very close friend, Andy Tanner, who is really an expert on both sides of this, which is why I wanted Andy to come on, um, because he's, he's written a book, 401 Chaos, on the negative side of the qualified plan. And of course, if you read my book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, you see that from a tax standpoint, there is some actual benefit to a qualified plan, although there are severe limitations, which we're going to talk about today. So Andy... Um, Welcome to the show. <laughs> Tom, it is it is just wonderful to spend time with you. Uh I I think I I think it uh, she people should know uh, I have a huge bias towards my friend uh Tom Wilwright. We've known each other for many many years. Uh our families are very close friends and my sons idolize you. <laughs> so we uh that's because they're only, looking for an a student that they can actually. yeah i'll tell you they need someone <laughs> uh they need someone better than their dad to to lead the way an example but seriously tom uh you know people should know also i don't know if i should disclaim tom tom also does my taxes so uh we know right. each other intimately well and we've traveled the world together um, it's just great to be with you, Tom. So, so thanks for the invitation. No, thank you. So, so just a little bit of your background. How'd you get into? Because your your book is stock market cash flow, and war on chaos. And how'd you get into? Uh, because you're, you know, my <laughs> recollection is you're a professional speaker. So that's how yeah. I think you're you're an educator. How'd you get into? Um, well, the, the stock, the stock market and that whole, yeah, well, I will tell you, I, I didn't come, uh, start out to be a teacher cause I was beating Warren Buffett in an investing contest when I started, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, I, I think the, usually the place I start is college. Um, I went to college cause I'm tall, can't jump, can't shoot, but I could foul. So they, uh, they put me on the team in basketball. And as I academically, you know, you have a accounting, B biology, all the way to zoology, Never found anything that I was passionate about. Just wasn't interested in those academic uh, uh, prospects. So when that was all over, I I fell into sales. I'm pretty good with people, I guess. And uh, in the 90s, uh, you know, the internet, online trading, I was selling a uh, software that would help people trade. And that was first introduction to stocks. So this is pretty cool. And then uh, as, as luck would have it, uh, Got to know our mutual friend, Robert, and I spent uh, 14 years traveling with him as a rich dad advisor. And then my wife fell ill and uh, my kids are in high school. So now I, uh, I stay home and I teach from, uh, uh, from, from here in my home office all around the world. That's the beautiful thing about the internet. And really, I, uh, I'm just have an attitude of gratitude every single morning. And we, we love trading stocks. And you're right. I did write a book that was, uh, extremely critical of 401k so i'll uh say that i'm a little biased uh i do agree with you though by the way the section on on your latest book on 401ks is wonderful especially from uh i i loved your book uh from a data standpoint you really brought the numbers in this one and just said look here's the math uh hard to argue with the numbers so uh while i'm critical of 401ks you know i acknowledge that there are circumstances if a person's um, and a highly paid employee and they don't want to, uh, learn to invest, but there's also some, I think, I think people, even those guys could do better though. So we'll talk about maybe the, the qualified plans, non-qualified plans. And, all right. uh, so, I'll, so, I'll, I'll, I'll give my so bias. Let's, <laughs> let's get into it. Let, let's start early. Okay. So, so, um, you're 30 years old, 20 years old, 40 years old, doesn't matter where you are. You might be 60 years old and you're going, okay, I would like to actually not have to work till yeah. I die. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I might want to work till I die. My dad worked till he was 88, um, but he didn't have to, he did it because he enjoyed it. 
And uh, we don't want to have to work till we're 88. We'd like sure. to be able to do other things and have the money to do that. So, um, you know, when we talk about the very first thing that we start with, it seems to me like we ought to start with a target as to, uh, you know, really what, what are we shooting for? Because uh, as you talk about in 401k, there are different ways to retire, right? There are different levels of retirement. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. you know, one of the questions I, I ask frequently on stage, and I think you probably do too, is how many of you want to retire rich and how many of you re want to retire poor? And I've yet to have anybody that actually raised their hand. They wanted to retire poor. And yet their retirement strategy seems to be focused on retiring poor. So, 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 so give us some of your, just kind of the big picture of what you've got to look at when you're looking at, you know, that target. You know, you and I think, I, I hate to be in an echo chamber, but you and I think exactly, I mean, precisely the same way. And I know that, uh, you know, Stephen Covey, uh, in his book, Seven Habits, said one of the habits is to begin with the end in mind. And uh, one of the things that I think has to be established before we, we make a blueprint for retirement in our pathway is exactly what you said. Where do you want to be and what level do you want to be at? One of the questions that drives me crazy that I get all the time is people will say, well, is, is this a good investment or is that a good investment? That's like asking me what I think about a lawnmower or a dishwasher. Uh, we need to know the task of hand. So for example, if you were to look at investments as a vehicle, as a place to take you to that promised land, and you say, Andy, is a car a good vehicle? I say, well, if you're going to the grocery store, probably, but if you want to go from Los Angeles to Hawaii, it's a non-starter. So when people say, is this a good investment vehicle? I really need to know two things first. What rates of return are you requiring to be able to get to the promised land? And then do you have an education that, that allows you, do you have a, an education that matches the sophistication of the investments and the risks that you're managing? So you know, in my opinion, if you want to go to Hawaii, that's like trying to go from uh, you know a 401k to me. If you want to go to the to the city park on your bicycle, that's wonderful. It's just wonderful. Get on your little 401k bicycle and go to the park. If you want to go from Los Angeles to Hawaii, uh, a 401k is like trying to ride a bicycle to Hawaii. <laughs> I like it. So, I, I, so I, I I think you hit it on the head, Tom. Um, you and I both, when we work with people, say, well, what's your dream? What do you want? How big? And then we can have a, a financial statement that we can look at today. This is what my wife and I do every Sunday. We say, where's our financial statement today? And then we have a financial statement that represents our future. How do we build that bridge? Yeah. So I'm actually going to show this on, on my screen, Andy, um, uh, realizing that some people are not going to be able to see this, but you can always go to our YouTube channel um, to see it. But I look at this, I, I kind of, I like to make it pretty simple. And so I draw, I draw simple drawings mostly because I can't draw. And <laughs> I, I really, uh, to me, if, if here's where you are today, okay. So you, you, you just say, all right, whatever today is, doesn't matter what today is, here's today. And then on the other end of the spectrum, here's my dream. All right. So this is my dream. This is where I'd like to be. Well, I have to do a couple of things. First of all, this is why your accountant, <laughs> frankly, is so important. Because the first thing I have to do, I'm going, I have to know what that means in terms of dollars today. So what do I have available to myself today to be investing in order to get to my dream, which also has to be in dollars. This is why you talk about the two financial statements, right? What's yep. my today financial statement? And what's my tomorrow financial statement? And that's really what we're talking about. Then I need two more pieces of data. And the first thing I need is time. There How you much, go. What, what's the time frame for this? And here's a great thing. So I, I have a degree in accounting, not finance, but I did take that finance class, Andy. And this is simply a very simple formula called a present value formula. If you know the numbers today, and you know where you want to get to tomorrow, and you know the amount of time you can solve for what Andy's talking about, return on investment. 
what go. return on investment do I need in order to accomplish where I want to go? So it's really actually pretty simple uh, when you when you put it into those terms. You, you're going to need some team members, as we talk about all the time, Andy. Um, but um, one of them being your bookkeeper, one of them being your accountant, one of you know some other people. But really, if you just put it in that simple framework, uh, because your ROI now you can add, now you can determine. All right, what's the vehicle, right, Andy? Um, yeah. Because because if your ROI is four percent. Uh, you can get four percent right now in a treasury in in, in, a, in a treasury note, right? You can get four percent, sure. so you, you can do four percent pretty easily, risk free. Um, doing if your if your number, I have a, a client uh, we're working with on this, uh, Andy, and and their number is twenty nine percent. Going, you can't wow. do that. A, you can't. I, I I don't know how you can ever get to twenty nine percent in a four hundred one k. Um, uh, I think that would be really challenging. Um, I don't think you can get there. You certainly can't get there in, in general stock bonds and mutual funds. Um, if you do it, the buy, hold and pray strategy that, uh, Kiyosaki's always talking about, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the way we invest, right? Buy, hold and pray that it goes up. Um, that's great when it's going up like it did the last 10 years, but it's not so good when you're in 2023 and it's not and it's going sideways, right? It's it's not going up. It's not dropping drastically, but it's not, it's certainly uh, best sideways. So now you have to look at all right. If my return on investment is, if what I want means my return on investment has to be higher, then I have to take a different approach. So that's what you're saying, right? I, I've got to jump on the plane. I can't be uh, or uh, our our friend Ken McElroy's jet, which I was on the other day. By the way, Andy, it, that that thing's like a sports car. That is so much fun. Um, but you you've got to have a different vehicle to do it. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. There's so many factors, and when you look at a 401k plan, there's an extremely limited choice uh, of investment vehicle. You're you're in a cut and paste template designed by someone else, and you're. You know, it's almost like being plopped in a little factory and you, you know, in and out. Here's some interesting numbers on how 401ks work. Van, there, there's $11 trillion in the United States alone in what we call defined contribution plans. These are 401k type things where employee contributes. And Vanguard has just shy of $2 trillion of it. So I look at their numbers all the time. Yeah, they, 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 they uh, Vanguard and Fidelity. And they have an interesting report every year called How America Saves. Uh, they have 2022 out. Obviously, we're still in 2023. And the statistics are bothersome. For example, uh, right now, if you are age uh, 55 to 64, in that 10 years before traditional retirement, the average balance in a Vanguard uh, 401k account is $89,760. Oh if you take the 4% rule, that's $299 a month to live on. So that means half the people at Vanguard have less than 90,000. And here's some other interesting statistics that might be interesting for people to hear. If you go to the Department of Labor and you find out what the average person in the USA spends to live, it's $67,000. And you might get 21,000 if you believe Social Security's there. So that means that I've got to come up with about $44,000 to just live an average life, not even a dream life. Tom, if you have 12 years left to go, the ROI you would need to get that $880,000 at a 5% return to get the 44 to, to make it, uh, it's 21%. And that doesn't usually happen. Now, ironically, as you know, I do a really strange thing at my house. We have a gap year we've decided to take. So between the eighth and ninth grade, my kids come home. They learn taxes from Tom. <laughs> they learn stocks from me. You know, they, they learn business. And my son uh, started out with, with dividends. You, you, uh, you sent me a wonderful book that actually teaches this very well. And, and he bought a company called Foot Locker. And through dividends and covered calls, he's gotten 21% in nine months. And so uh, those types of returns are not available 
in 401k. So that's kind of the downside of it. I think the tax side, if you have a tax conversation, it can make a lot of sense, but it goes back to exactly what you said, beginning, end, time, what do I need to get to get my dream? I might find that, that I'm going to have to do some things in addition to that 401k, or maybe I just go a different direction entirely. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, and and let's, I'm, I want to back up just a little bit so people understand, you know, defined contribution plans mean means that the amount um, that you get out is defined by how much money you put in. Yeah. Okay. So we're defining the contribution, not how much you get out. A defined yeah. benefit is the opposite. opposite. That's uh, what typically you think of as a pension plan. I want you to know, Andy, I do celebrate every month I get a pension check from an old employer. It's $473. Hey. So very exciting. And I will get that for the rest of my life. So um, there you go. I've, I've got my supplement to Social Security. Um, you know, if I had something like that, Tom, I, I changed that changed my life because every time I'm in the drive through at McDonald's, I'd say supersize me. And you go for the big one when you're bringing in that kind of money. There you go. Exactly. So, um, but that's a defined benefit plan. That means that uh, um, what's defined is what you're going to get out, not what's put in. These yeah. are the pension plans. And these are the pension plans that uh, Ted Siddell um, in uh, Who Stole My Pension is talking about. They're in trouble. They're the ones in trouble. They're, they're the CalPERS, the, uh, California Retirement System. There's Illinois, the Kentucky. State Retirement System, Illinois, et cetera. Um, some of them are clearly bankrupt. And they'll they'll get bailed out. That, that's likely what's going to happen. The problem is, is that the corporate ones won't get bailed out. So while the public service ones are likely to get bailed out, probably the corporate pension plans, they get haircuts. So like airlines, um, the, the, the unions, they, they got a haircut um, a while back. And so sure. that's, that's, you know, cause they have to deal with reality. They can't just rely on government printing money. Like, um, like, uh, you know, retirement system can at a, at a state university. Um, but, then you have um, different types of defined contribution plans. So if you're an employer, you can actually put money in called a, it's just called a profit sharing plan where you actually share the profits with your employees. And that's one thing you can do. If, um, if you're self-employed, you can put it in uh, what's called a SEP, self-employed uh, pension plan. And it's a, basically an IRA, but it's a supersized IRA. You can put yeah. a lot more in. And then you've got, uh, of course, the traditional 401k, which is what's the what, what's the max into a, a traditional 401k right now, Andy? Uh, you know, I don't know what the max, I don't have one, so I don't know what the max is, oh. but I, I can tell you, I can tell you this, um, there is a limit to what you can put in for sure, which is another <laughs> limitation of what you might be able to put away for your vehicle. But I, I will tell you, I, I, I made some mistakes uh, when I wrote my first book that I think would be interesting for people to know about. I think that I've got a couple things I think your listeners would be really interested in. One of the mistakes I made when I wrote 401k is I didn't include the history. You can learn a lot from the history of 401k. So in my second edition, I corrected that. And this is what I would recommend um, people think about. Uh, when you learn financial statements, you'll always learn there's a posing financial statement on the other side of the deal. My mortgage might be the bank's asset if I have a mortgage. My car payment, if I have one, would be the bank's asset. So there's always two sides. And in, in, a, in a 401k, you really have a few parties. You have the worker, you have the employer, you have the government, you have Wall Street. Right. And if a person takes the time to learn how these came to be, and I, I think I can do it in, in a couple minutes, but I think it'd be fascinating some things that listeners don't know about the most predominant, pervasive program in the United States. Go for it. Um, in 1875, a couple hundred years ago, there was a company called American Express. They were a courier like Federal Express. 1875. Yeah, 1875. Got it. And they, uh, they didn't have credit cards then. They were a courier like UPS or Federal Express. They had the first pension in the United States. And it was awful. Uh, you had to be vested for 20 years. And uh, there was a committee that could take you out. If you went on strike, you were over. And the pension was simple. It was designed by corporations to attract human capital. Um, humans are a resource. And it was to chain you to your desk without chaining you to your desk. That's it. And uh, as these grew, uh, 
uh, the pendulum swung towards unions. And there was a company in the 1950s and 60s called the Studebaker Company, and they were going bankrupt. Cars weren't selling, and they had these huge pensions, millstone around their neck. And, uh, and the unions wouldn't budge, and they went out of business. So they went to Congress, and the unions were brilliant. They said, hey, we don't really care if the companies uh, go, go dead or not, but if we could transfer the liability to the taxpayer from a corporation, we could negotiate better and higher uh, pensions. And they lobbied for many years, and finally President Ford in 1972 uh, signed something called ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And that uh, gave some some insurance to pensions. Well, this was bad news for for employers. I mean, these regulations, the liabilities, the legalities, paying now they had to pay insurance in case they went out, and it it was tough. And uh, there was a congressman, and this is the story I think people are most interested in. There's a congressman congressman in upstate New York named Barbara Carnival, and he had two constituents, Xerox and uh, Kodak. And at the time, ERISA had frozen some, some rules on benefits. So if you worked for a bank in that time and you got a Christmas bonus of 100 grand, 75,000 of it went to taxes, 25 grand went to you. So it was rough. And so they wanted to create a, uh, a loophole where they could say, we're going to take these bonuses and defer them. And they allowed banks to do that. Well, Conor Barber had had Xerox and Crafts get in his ear and say, hey, we want, we want something written in where we could do something like that. And so Conor hired a young lawyer who was 24 years old named Richard Stanger, right out of uh, college. And he said, write, uh, write a little section of the tax code called 401k that will allow these guys to defer big bonuses. And it was less than a thousand words, Tom, less than a thousand words. And this is what I think people don't know. Whenever you start fooling around with the tax code, they do numbers to see what will affect the U.S. bottom line in terms of taxes. So they took it through. You know, Congress had these guys, RS had these guys, a bunch of think tanks. And I interviewed Richard Stanger, actually. And I about fell out of my chair. He said, Andy, it was interesting. As I wrote this thing as a young lawyer, less than a thousand words. And when we ran it through the numbers, they came back and they said, this will cost the U.S. government in tax loss less than $1 million a year. Hmm. And he said, either there isn't a reason to do it or, or something screwy, but they did it. And uh, obviously, this was never designed to become the predominant uh, plan in the United States. Right. Well, the this, last this, part this, is this was at a time, this is at a time when most people had a pension plan, right? Yes, yes. Well, to, this was in 1978, and in the year 1980, there was a, an interesting man. He was a retirement consultant named Ted Benna, and he was working with a bank that had had their rules frozen. They were trying to attract employees from other banks. They couldn't get them because they couldn't get this loophole. And he said, you know, I wonder if I could get 401k to work with this, but there was one problem. Richard Stanger had written in some equality laws that said, if you don't have everyone benefiting, a certain amount of the rich people and the poor people benefiting, high employees, low employees, how do you get a bank teller excited about deferring their tax bonus if it's $100, right? And he said, what if we gave them some bait and matched it? And the bank tellers bought in. Well, this bank said, we don't want to be pioneering. This, this is scary. So Ted said, you know, let's do it in our own firm. And then in January 1st of 1980, the first 401k was born and it unlocked, it took the handcuffs of pensions off. Companies, if you look at it from a financial standpoint, Tom, people should know this. A pension is a function of the income statement and a 401k is a function of the balance sheet. Right. That is not a small change. No financial education. Everyone said 401k, pension, it's just retirement. But when you take a pension that's a function of income and cash flow and you turn that over and make it a function of your balance sheet, now you're managing the risk. Of now you're, you have a nest egg, you have an hourglass that might not last you. And these are some of the things I have. Well, to finish the story, 40 years goes by and Conorable Barber is no longer on the House Ways and Means Committee. He's, he's kind of retired. 
and he's at a social luncheon and everyone comes up and lunch says, congratulations, Bonnie. Well, congratulations is what? And he goes, well, there's a, there's a pension magazine that nominated you as one of the most influential, top 100 influential people on the planet because uh, you of your work on the 401k. He said, my work on the what? 40 years. My work on the what? And he said, they said, well, the 401k goes, don't know what you're talking about. No, you did this. He calls up his old staffers at the Ways and Means Committee and he said, did I have anything to do with the 401k? He says, yeah, you sponsored the bill. Uh, you passed it. Uh, you're the guy. The most significant legislation he passed his entire career, he was totally unaware of because this was born to be a small loophole for a couple of executives. You know, the, the law of unintended consequences here is, I think it's an interesting story. I don't know if listeners think it's well, interesting. Never designed to do this, Tom. Never designed what, to do this. Here's what's interesting, Andy. So if you look at uh, chapter eight of my book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, I run those numbers. And sure enough, it's a, it's a break-even for the government. Yeah. It's right at a break-even for the government. The government doesn't make money on it. Don't lose, doesn't lose money on it. Interestingly, um, I look at seven investments in, in that book and the other six, the government actually makes money. So this is the only one that's a break even yeah. for the government, which is interesting. But, the one but you know, it plays out really what uh, what uh, Stanger said is that, you know, it, it was only going to cost a million dollars. Probably is still the case. It does not cost them much money. The, the ones that won, if you look at all the financial statements, um, the losers, the biggest losers are uh, are the workers for sure. If you line up all of them, government break even, uh, corporations win huge. They get to sever those ties. You know, yeah. no more they, liabilities. They winner though. Wall Street is sure. zero risk, um, zero capital put up, uh, zero responsibility where it goes up down. They collect their fees. I have some interesting spreadsheets uh, I should share with people someday. Even if they take a half percent out, up to two percent out in fees. Uh, the lion's share of that money uh, goes to Wall Street. Yeah. So okay. So, so, so that's interesting. But, but here's the thing: that the question still is, do I invest in the stock market or something else? Because yes, the four hundred one k. Um, now we don't. Most people don't get a pension plan. So right. that that's the fact of the matter. So now what we have to look at is okay, that ship sailed. Um, unless you're a school teacher or a police officer or fireman, you probably don't have a pension, okay? Or you have right. a $473 pension like I do, right. okay? And so <laughs> and so, what do we do instead is the question. And, and here's my question for you. So, um, you know, I think that the first thing we have to do is look at, okay, what's that rate of return? But then we have to look at, okay, so now we have to choose the vehicle, right? Yes. And so, and so let's say that you decide the vehicle that you want is the stock market. Okay, so that is one of the, remember, it's, uh, for our listeners, um, the stocks, bonds, mutual funds, that's something you can invest in in 401k. That's why Wall Street's the big winner yeah. because it's, yeah. Wall Street is, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but Wall Street's effectively a Ponzi scheme um, because sure. it depends on new money in order to uh, pay old money. And that's the definition Absolutely. of a Ponzi scheme. It depends Absolutely. on the new money coming in. The reason that the stock market goes up primarily is new money coming in. I mean, it can go up because of production efficiencies by the underlying companies. Oh, you bring up a great point. But it really goes up probably even more. It's really supply and demand because yeah. it's how there's only so many stocks. Uh, it, I mean, the, the Dow has 30, the S&P has 500. Russell has 2000, right? I mean, that's not a lot still. I mean, you're yeah. talking about a few companies and now you, the more money that goes in that just by definition, more money chasing fewer goods is the definition of inflation. And so there we get price inflation, which is what we've had since 2008, right? We've had huge price inflation in the stock market. So, so given that that's available, and if you were going to invest through, if you were going to invest in the stock market, why wouldn't you do a 401k? Because to me, it makes sense, actually, if, unless you want to control it, unless you want right. to actually determine 
where that's money invest is invested. Because remember, you don't get to do that. Qualified means government controlled, just so everybody understands. Yeah, qualified but- plan means government controlled plan. It means that you don't, you don't, they get to control how much money you put in, how much you take it out, when you take it out, how much tax benefit going in, how much tax benefit going out. They, the government actually controls pretty much everything about that plan. All you control is how much money you put in and at what point after you retire, you take it out, right? Yeah. Let me answer that question in two ways. Um, It's a great question. Why wouldn't you put the money in, right? Why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, there's a there's a wonderful book by Robert Kiyosaki that I really love called The Cash Flow Quadrant. And what it does is it gives you really a, a draws two lines in the sand, one this way and one this way. And it says, how do you want to make your money? You want to make your money as an employee, self-employed, investor, business owner. I think that's the first choice to make because if you choose the 401k plan, you are squarely putting yourself in that E quadrant. So if a person says, you know, I don't want to be an employee, I want to be in one of these other uh, three quadrants and I see better benefits there, then that's one reason right there. Why not invest in 401k? Because I don't want to be an E. So my my dreams are different. So that's one reason. So, so that's that's, a, so, so that's actually a good argument for a 401k for employees because you're, you're, yes, it what, is. what you're saying is, look, if you're an employee, and and as a as a tax uh, professional, I can tell you that if you're an employee, there are very few the options. Match. There are very few options for tax benefits as an employee. The the two that I talk about in my book are life insurance and yep. qualified plans, and those are the two logical ones. Even as self employed, there's some, but again, you uh, I see a lot of self employed people do some type of a qualified plan. It may not be a four hundred one k. Um, but they probably have 401k for their employees. Like you say, it's a way to attract human capital. And uh, in fact, a, a lot of companies, they do it for that sole reason, because yeah. if you don't have a 401k, you can not attract the people, right? Yeah. My, my CPA firm, I will admit, we have a 401k. Why do we have a 401k? Attract not, because, people. not because I'm a fan of 401ks, but we uh, are, when we go to recruit somebody, one of the first questions they ask is, tell me about your 401k. It's an education issue. If you have educated yourself to be a solid employee, uh, and that's where you want to be for sure. The the second reason we've kind of already covered is we want to say, well, great, but can that 401k get me from A to B? You have to understand that. But more to your point, I thought you made a great point here. There's a little bit of of jargon here. When you buy a business, if I were to come and, and want to buy your business, we'd look at your financial statement. And we call this, there's some fundamental things I'd want to see, some growth, some income. Uh, we'd look at cash statements flow. of cash flows. Are you are you using are your cash flow coming from debt, investment, or operations? Those are fundamental reasons to buy. And that's how I buy stocks. What you talked about is what we call technicals, is price movement of the company. And so what's interesting is when I buy stocks, I buy them because I see something that's fundamentally sound. But when 401k people buy stocks, they buy them because they're unscheduled to do so. And so there becomes a detachment between the fundamental value of this company and its price because everyone's buying in a frenzy. The problem with that is, is there's questions as to how sustainable that can be, right? If everyone's putting money in their 401k, you think price is going up. But here's another difference. Are you going to invest for capital gains, hoping stock prices go up, which you can't control? Or are you going to invest more for dividends or real estate distributions? And I'll just use my son, if I may, uh, for an example. So he he bought uh, 100 shares of Foot Locker. He's 15. He's going to buy a million shares. And he received, uh, uh, so far in the, in the nine months, he's had three dividends, $120. And he's the, it was a $40 stock, so he spent $4,000. And he received about $500 from the options market. That has nothing to do with the price of his stock. That has to do with selling shoes and getting a, a, a part of that cash and dealing with the options market, which, which is always there. So he's independent. If you actually add in the capital gain he's gotten, which I don't count on, it's actually 30% per annum. 
but he's at 21 without it. Now, here's what's key. At the rule of 72, he'll have that stock paid off in about 3.4 years. Free you mean, and clear. You mean, you mean with the options and the dividends? Correct. With dividends, with, with income from cash flow rather than capital gain. At that moment, the price of that stock is irrelevant for the rest of eternity. He can put that in a trust. His grandkids can have it. His great grandkids. He can have that part of the family trust. And he no longer needs to worry about the direction of the price or the stock market. He only needs to worry is if are they still selling shoes? Are they still paying a dividend? And with inflation, you know, they've survived the end. Most retailers got wiped out from Amazon. So if you're still around, you're probably pretty good. If, if they still sell shoes, inflation will cause that dividend to grow. Um, so there's, there's some inflation protection built in and he doesn't have to worry. Now, that's a totally opposite approach than the 401k, which is based on the price of stocks going up to increase your balance sheet and hope your hourglass doesn't run out. So these are things for people to think about that those opportunities that Dave is learning about do not exist in a 401k. They right. do not participate in the stock market in the same way that, that, that my students learn to participate in the stock market. So, so if I can kind of simplify that down just a little bit, um, seems to me it's just a function of how much control do you want? Risk is about control. That, that, isn't that's it? really really what it is. I mean, uh, certainly the more control you have, the less risk you have, and you can control that risk. Um, if you just put the money in every month into 401k, you're just at the risk of wherever the market is. And uh, you know, if, it, if the market's really high and then it drops, you've lost money. If the market's really low, you make money, which is why the, the average investor makes a lot less than the stock market because of when they're putting the money in and out, right? So so this is, uh, and, and I think this is an important point to, to understand. So what one of the things Andy mentioned earlier was that if, you, if, if you're an employee and you're really not interested in the education side of things, so you really would like this to be on autopilot, then a 401k may be exactly what you want because the, the whole point of the mutual fund or... Um, exchange traded fund the etf is really to, hands off it's it's just to be hands off but managed risk which we call diversification right which the point of diversification is to not lose money it's not to make money but it's to not lose money so what you're trying to do is you know warren buffett said one of the keys to success in investing is don't lose money um it seems obvious but actually losing money has such a huge impact on your portfolio that losing money is really a bad bad thing. You really need yeah. to just have that constant flow. But that's a very slow way to do it. So then again, we're getting back to what kind of vehicle do you want? Do you want a 6% vehicle? And if you do, I mean, for example, you read you know that old book, The Millionaire Next Door. Um, yeah. We know people like that, right? They just- School teachers. <laughs> they- uh, not just school teachers. They could be financial analysts. They can be, you know, they're corporate. You know, they're, sure. be, they're in the corporate world um, or, the, or the government world, one of those two. And they just love to sock away money, right? They're, they're just, they're living on the minimum amount of money. They're, they're getting by, but they're socking away money and, if, and they're socking away as much as possible. So um, they're maxing out their 401k every year. They're going to max out their IRA every year on top of the 401k to the extent they can do that, even if it's non-deductible, they're just going to keep putting money away um, to the best they can. And if that's what you're doing and you're not going to actually get educated and want to take the time like David has to, to learn how to do things like options, people, people get scared with options I'm going. So here, here's what I learned. So um, the little known fact is that years ago, about 20 years ago, I actually got my Series 7 license, Andy. Oh, and my word. Um, I went through, it, it takes about six weeks mm -hmm. to uh, become a financial advisor. That's what it took me. And what you have to do is you have to study. It's a self-study course. And then you take a test. Okay. <laughs> now, it's I, a I got, big test. It, it's, a, it's a big test. It's all day. And uh, I actually had to take it twice because the computer broke down in the middle of the first time. Oh, God. So I literally had to go back. And of course, it's a different test every time. But yeah. here's what I learned. I learned that um, on that test, about 50% of the questions about were about options. 
and using covered calls and things like that. So my point is, is that I learned that in six weeks. So this is not, uh, don't, don't be afraid of it just because you think, oh, options, that's, yeah. that's so complicated. It's not that complicated. So Andy, Andy, in another, another time you can go to, to, to Andy and we'll, we'll get uh, your website Maybe out there. another day. But, Maybe another day. But Andy can teach you how to do covered calls and, and how to, how to do options trading. But if you're, if you're going, well, wait a minute, I would really like this to be on autopilot. Then honestly, um, and I was surprised by this, frankly, when I ran the numbers, uh, when I was writing uh, Win Win Wealth Strategy, I was surprised that from a tax standpoint, it really does work for you. And the reason yeah. is because you get the deduction um, when you put money into the 401k, it's coming off your highest rate of tax. So we yeah. have progressive income tax. So if your highest rate is say 33%, your average rate's probably 17% but your highest right. rate is 33%. Well, that deduction comes, you get a benefit at 33%. Yeah. When you pull it out, you get all of the brackets. And so now you're really looking at the average rate. So if you had, if you were making $200,000 while you were working and you put in money into your 401k and then you make $200,000 pulling out of your 401k, let's say you've done really well in your 401k, you've really managed it well, then that $200,000 will be at a lower tax rate, average tax rate than what the tax benefit was when you put it in. So you really do have more money in it. And it really does, no. that there, there is this, it's because we have a progressive income tax system. If we have a flat tax system, it wouldn't work. But we have a progressive income tax system. And because oh, we have yeah, a progressive income tax system, it, it, it does work. Okay, so we, we've kind of kind of gone down that uh, 401k, et cetera path. But let's say we, we look at our little uh, simple little chart here. We go, that vehicle, that return on investment, I'm not comfortable. Um, if you ask any financial uh, advisor, they will say, do not plan on more than a 10% return. In, in, in the stock market. They are not allowed to say that. That's actually illegal for them to suggest more than that. For sure. And so you go, okay, but based on mine, I need, I need 17%. Okay, so I can't do it in a 401k. That, that, I just can't do that. So the alternative to a qualified plan, we call a non-qualified plan. Yeah. And a non-qualified plan simply means Again, think about the control. It's not controlled by the government. <laughs> they don't control how much money you put in. They don't control where you put it. Um, you don't have to put it into Wall Street. They don't control when you take it out. They don't control what you do with it. So that is a non-qualified. So change qualified to controlled, okay? And you have a controlled plan, government controlled plan, or a government not controlled plan, right? So the government doesn't control the other plan. So basically a non-qualified plan is, anything else. It, it's yeah. really any plan that you have that does not include a pension, profit sharing, 401k, IRA. So, so talk about why, I mean, because we do know there are tax benefits to be, you know, you get that tax deferral, you get it deferred to a lower rate. What then is the benefit of going to a non-qualified plan, Andy? Well, uh, I think you mentioned a lot of them because when you go to a non-qualified plan, your ability to be creative, your ability to really expand to all the asset classes, to, 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 it's just a lot more control and a lot more options. Now, if you compare the two, if you decide you want to be in the E quadrant, then be a great E, be a highly paid employee. If you're a thoracic surgeon and you make better than average on a, a, you know, you're putting this money away, taxes are, are rough for S's and great. But if you're, if you're not going to be in that upper crust of the E quadrant, boy, you're going to have a hard time in the, in the qualified plans. A non-qualified plan though, and the, the first thing I would say is you have either the burden or the benefit of a team, depending on how you look at it. I look at it as a benefit. Some people say, well, if I decide to do a non-qualified plan, they look at the downside this way. They might say, well, uh, I'm going to have to learn a lot, and now I'm going to have to get an accountant, or I'm going to get an attorney. Or you can say, hey, 
now I get to learn a lot and I get the help from an accountant and an attorney and a bookkeeper. And that's the way I feel about, it. you know, it's funny how attitude is on this, Tom. I remember in the third grade, I, I took on a basketball team with my sons. I had the meeting with the parents and I said, I'm going to uh, practice every day after school for your son. We're going to video every game he does. I'm going to do a breakdown of it. And I had a parent say, really? In the third grade, you're going to practice every day. You're going to do a film of every game in the third grade, really? How do other parents say, really? You'll provide a practice every day. and you." So it's very much the same attitude of, wow. People would say, oh, that's so much to learn. Now oh, there's so much I can learn. And I think the first thing I would do if I decide I'd like to investigate you know, my options for non-qualified plans is I start with a team. Um, I'd say, who is like, I'm going to drive the ship, but I'll tell you, I need my number one on that team is your accountant but by far. And I had a, a person, a friend of mine talking about yesterday he came over to my house. They said, your accountant and your attorney have to talk together. They have to, because your, your attorney is going to talk tax, your accountant's going to talk protection, and they'll go to the extremes. They got to talk to each other and find the right mix of protection and tax. And it's fun. Uh, all, you learn so much and you have these incredible people that are way more interested in what you're doing than the guy running a 401k that you've never met. So I would say the first thing, if you want to go non-qualified, is a team. The second thing is education. And the third thing, there's a certain temperament. Uh, and we could talk about those things if you wanted. So, so I, I want to go back to the team because I, you know, I, good or bad, I spend a lot of time with rich people. Um, I like it. I think rich people are interesting. Um, it's, it's not my goal in life to make rich people richer. Frankly, it's my goal in life to make an average person rich. Yeah. Uh, that that is, you know, the average entrepreneur. I want them to become rich so that they're financially free. That is um, our uh, declaration of financial independence. Uh, Wealth ability. My company is that we believe everybody has the right to become independent of employers, the government, and Wall Street. So that's you know th that's fundamentally in my core. But when I when I look at this team, I'm going and I look at rich people. I go. Okay, so what do all rich people have? Let's think about somebody, a family like the Rockefellers or the yeah. Waltons or um, any, any of these, um, any of these uh, Vanderbilts, you know, they have something in common. They have what's called a family office. Yeah. And that family office is pretty magical. It includes, yeah, it includes an accountant and attorney. It also includes probably several different types of attorney, not just an, an estate plan attorney, an asset protection attorney, a contract attorney, right? It includes it includes financial advisors. It includes um, it includes life insurance people. It's all these people that are surrounded. And I'm going, okay, so by the way, no billionaire ever became a billionaire in a 401k. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not possible. In fact, every billionaire has become a billionaire um, being in control. Well, of, even, of even doing. more so, Tom, I've never, ever in my whole, all the speech I've given, I've never even found a poor person that became semi rich with a 401k. Right. Again, it, the it, it's, it's just not possible. The, the problem is the money, the, the numbers don't work. No ROI. Yeah. The, the, the numbers don't work. I mean, you, you can't make the numbers work. So Correct. that doesn't mean that. Again, 401ks doesn't mean they're bad. It means that they're right for certain people yes. that want a certain type of vehicle. I mean, for example, um, uh, I don't know if I told you this, Andy, but I, I recently bought a BMW um, M8 competition. Well, this is the fastest BMW made. And um, this was not, you know, it's not a Chevy. And uh, it's not even a Chevy Corvette. Now, I, I'm happy to race that Chevy Corvette because the Chevy Corvette does not have a chance against my M8. Well, so why? why? Why am I willing to spend money on a BMW when I could get a Chevy? It's way cheaper to get a Chevy. Well, because that's not the vehicle I want, right? I want a different vehicle to do different things, right? Yeah. When I, when 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 I'm in that M8, I can be I it can be pouring rain and I'm in complete control of that car. It does not swerve, it does not it doesn't do anything. It's amazing. Well, that's what I want. I want that solid 
you know, German manufacturer. Yeah. I want that yeah. solid feeling. And so you can choose to drive a Chevy and there are a lot of people, you know, uh, drive a, a, a Prius or they drive a, uh, they drive a Volkswagen. Um, you know, that's fine. And if that's what you want, great. And that's yeah. what you should do. So, yes. I, you know, I think Andy and I, we'd agree that neither of us think that there's a, this is not a one size fit all. The problem is, is that that Wall Street wants you to believe it's a one size fit all. Wall, Wall Street wants you to believe that they're smarter about your money than you are. And they don't, they go, the less, they, they want to make it opaque. Okay. They don't want to make it transparent. They don't want to make it opaque. And so what Andy and I have pretty much devoted our lives to is let's make it transparent. This is why we travel with Kiyosaki. He wants to make it transparent. He wants to say, look, we get that you've been taught the E and the S side, the employee and the self-employed side of the cash flow quadrant. That's that's what the that schools teach. They teach those two sides. They didn't teach how to become a big business. They didn't teach about systems and how to become a big business. They didn't teach about how to become a professional investor or an insider. They don't, they don't teach that in school. So so all we're talking about is, okay, let's just be transparent with this. So when okay. when you're looking at these returns and you look at, okay, I, this is a long, long, long story longer. Um, <laughs> you look at, all right, who's on my team? You know, there's that, the, the, the old rule that the six people you spend the most time with, that's going to be your, that their average income is going to be your income likely. Right. And so um, the same is true with your team, you know, constantly upgrading your team. This is what I find. So Andy, you, I mean, you and I've had this conversation because yes. you were with you were with a different tax advisor before me, it, and it we, we we had to upgrade things a little bit. Tom, I was telling you, I had a friend, an old basketball buddy, over at my house yesterday. Said, "Andy, I'd like to talk," and uh, just I said, "Well, who's your accountant right now?" Same company, the same firm that I was with, exactly the same. I says, "Well, you know, I, I'm certainly not with them anymore, uh, right?" And so you do upgrade your game. I, I, I love what you said about choice. You know, even a person in the E-quadrant should learn a little bit. We, you mentioned diversification. Great, but that doesn't do anything against systemic risk. Nothing. In fact, the more you diversify, the more exposure to systemic risk you have. So if you're meaning, a 401k. Meaning, meaning risk in the market, right? Well, if, if you know, there's it's a company system. called BP. Uh, people think it's British Petroleum. No, they're actually known for broken pipe now. And when they broke that pipe in the Gulf of Mexico, their stock went from 60 to 30. Well, if you only had you know 1% of your wealth in that, you lose a half percent of your wealth. But two years later, the S&P 500 in the, in the, in the uh, subprime meltdown, it lost 50%. The whole system lost 50%. That's timing risk. If you're like my father... And you retire in 1999 before the, the dot-com bubble, you had a decade of nothing in the NASDAQ. He can't go from 60 to 70 with no ability to dollar cost average. So even if you're in the quadrant, you should have a team. You should have an accountant. And maybe you you say, hmm, you know, I, I have a good job. I'm in this higher paid thing. But you know what? There's nothing that prevents me from doing my qualified plan. That's great but I'd like to do some non-qualified stuff as well. And I can ride both of these. There's nothing wrong with that. And so get, uh, you know, get your team. It, 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 it's important with temperament as well, Tom. You have helped my temperament so much. I think that Warren Buffett's brilliance often overshadows his temperament and his passion. He has a wonderful temperament and you know, he gets up every day can do whatever he wants to do and he chooses to go to the office. That's a person who's passionate about non-qualified uh, investments. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. So, so if you could give um, our listeners just um, two or three actions that they can take in the next week or two um, to get yeah. started on this, what, what would you tell them? Uh, first thing is I would start a habit. I'll give you two or three. Uh, number one would be a habit of a weekly meeting, uh, whether you're single, you know, married, you know, whatever your partner is. Um, ours isn't perfect. You know this, Tom, you do my taxes. But Marcy and I, every Sunday at 11 a.m., 
uh, we get out our financial statement and we check uh, basically six numbers, income expenses, you know, net income or cash flow, assets, liabilities, net worth. We say, where are we right now? Then we compare that to a financial statement of our dreams and we get that ROI we talked about. Are we, are we making it? Are we headed there? So that would be the first thing uh, that I would do is start to have a weekly meeting. What you focus on expands. Number two, I'd evaluate my team. I'd say, who is my accountant? Who is my attorney? Do I have one? And people are so worried about spending money. They think this is a falsehood. They think, well, you know, accounts are expensive. Attorneys are expensive. Okay. If you are not sophisticated, your accountant can bill you an hour because you're going to be done in an hour. As you grow and you have more money, you'll be more sophisticated. But I will tell you, I, I have never found a time in my life, regardless of who I was with, where I spent more on the attorney than they saved me in taxes. It has been an ROI you, every you time. You the accountant, of course, not the attorney. Yeah. Every time it is say, the, yeah, the accountant, I can't say about the attorney, but the accountant uh, has brought me an immediate ROI as an investor. You got to think about that because I agree the, the fastest way to permanently increase your tax, your cash flow is to reduce the expense of taxes. Uh, that would be the second thing. And then the third thing is, is I would, I would dream big. And I would be optimistic. I would think about what I, my talents are. I think about what my dreams are, how I can serve. Capitalism is about inequality. What it's about is you have to give more than you receive. Right. You paid a thousand dollars for an iPhone because you thought the iPhone was worth more. And so you always figure out how can I give more than I take? Now people say, how are you gonna get rich if you're always on the short end of the stick? If you're always giving more, then what the people pay, how do you get rich? You serve more people. So think about how you can serve more people. And perhaps, uh, perhaps you say, you know what? I make you know, five, $600,000 a year and a 401k for me is great. Maybe I just want to learn a little bit about systemic risk, but maybe you have this sense, there's something more for me. There's more, maybe I'll spend some time thinking and there's more I could do for the world. So those three things, have your weekly meeting, start getting focused, evaluate your team, and then start thinking about what you might be passionate, how you might serve more people and, uh, and enjoy, uh, enjoy the benefits of, of giving more than you take. You, you know, I, I, love, I, I love the dream big because I think that the worst thing that a financial advisor or financial planner can say to you is, how much do you need to retire? Oh, scarcity, right? That is Minimum. like, what do you what do you mean? You mean so I don't live under a bridge, so I don't live on a park bench? What what, what do you mean by need? And so yeah. I, I love want. the dream big. How much do you want? Yeah. And so why not? Because you know, it's once you get a little education, it, you know, it, it, the reason the financial planner says how much do you need is because they can't deliver more than ten percent, and so. That means that you are limited on how big your dreams can be yeah. based on what they're telling you. Okay, I'm going to set aside this much money. It's going to go into these mutual funds, ETFs, whatever. And I'm going to get, say, let's say I get 8%. Okay, great. Great. That means every um, every nine years, my um, my my pot doubles, right? That's the rule of 72. So eight times nine, 72, right? Um, so that's, that's what the rule 72 says basically. So, um, eight, you know, eight, eight percent may be fine if, if you want to live modestly and you want to set aside that money modestly and you don't want to pay attention. But it, but the thing is with a little education and if you, if you dream big, then all of a sudden you go, well, wait a minute. Are you kidding me? Andy's 15 year olds getting 21%. In the stock market, this for is sure. not, this stock is stock. not. Yeah. I mean, you know, Andy's talking about the stock market. I mean, for me, you know, I look at business, real estate, um, energy, agriculture. I'm more of a a, a non traditional asset type guy, and um, because I love again, Andy talks about serving more people, and I actually pay a lot less tax. The more money I put back into productive use, the less tax I pay. So that's but but you have to dream big, and once you do. And you get that education, you can 
You don't have to worry about, okay, it's 29% too much. No, we can get there. We just have to kind of reassess. We just can't do it through a 401k, an IRA or pension plan. So um, with that, Andy, tell us where uh, they can get more information about your educational materials and, um, uh, and, and reach you. Well, thank you. I, I'll, I'll do a shameless plug. Uh, we have a, a website called the cashflowacademy.com, the cashflowacademy.com. I have a wonderful team of teachers. Uh, you know, we have, we have people with tremendous uh, options experience and stock experience. We have series four option principal. I mean, we have uh, uh, a big time teachers in risk management. And, uh, and so you can drop by, but, but more importantly, whether you learn from me or whether you learn from someone else, uh, learn about what your plan is. The majority of Americans don't understand their 401k or their 401a or their 403b or whatever they're in. Get educated. Take time and uh, and always be learning. And then the, the final thing I, I just have to say, I, I, I'm going to embarrass Tom, but he is such a good man. And I am so grateful uh, for our friendship, Tom. And the chance to teach with you and, and share ideas with people you is special to me. And uh, the influence you've had on my children as not only my tax advisor, but my friend uh, is completely just indescribably priceless. And so I love you. I love your family and my kids love you. And uh, I am just so grateful for our friendship and all the things you've taught me over decades now. So thank you for having me. And uh I just, uh, man, I love you with every cell in my body. So there you go. Well, thank you. Uh, if you haven't noticed, we are we are uh, presidents of each other's fan clubs. So um, <laughs> and Andy's the best teacher when it comes to uh, stock market, particularly cash flowing stock market that I've ever seen. And so I, I highly recommend the Cashflow Academy um, without reservation, uh, just because I know Andy's got your interest in heart. He's got the, his students' interest in heart. It's not for him about making money. It's about how does he, you know, how does he, how do you get that education? And I'm learning from Andy all the time. So I learn uh, at least as much from Andy as Andy's ever learned from me, um, both about both about, um, you know, making things simple and interesting. Um, you know, I always say my goal in life is to make taxes fun, easy, and understandable. And uh, uh, so it's it's fun to be able to, to work with Andy and his kids because, you know, and it as Albert Einstein said, um, any six-year-old can explain something to a genius, but it takes a genius to explain something to a six-year-old. So yeah. um, what... What uh, I hope you've gotten out of today is that, you know, remember those three things that you, you do need to meet. You need to establish where you are and where you're going. Establish that plan of action, that, that wealth strategy. And then you need to build that team around you. And don't forget to think big. And when you do that, you're going to make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see you all next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.